kind of cool when we started, but now it got toasty. Atley turned with me. I don't remember where I started at. Where is that? Let me get notes out here. All right. You know the drill. Stand with me as we read just a portion of the Word of God. Wherein... You greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. How many of you have been tried by fire just recently, that the trial of your faith, you're in a trial. Okay, pray with me. Father, I realize that trials are nothing more than tests. And I know that many times those tests show us where we are in our walk with you. I also know that the difference in a trial and a temptation is that you do not tempt. But temptation comes when we are drawn away, enticed by our own lust. Open up your word to us today. Deliver through us that which might help us as a people that are in the fiery trial of our life. Open the word to us now. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. A trial, I looked up in the dictionary, a a dictionary, uh, I I, I watch a lot of... uh, so much filth on television that with young grandbabies around the house, we have to be very careful because they pick up every word, you know, just everything that they pick up. Uh, I told the dogs here recently to S-H-U-T up. And it's okay until one of them hollered out at the dogs the other day to shut. But the proper technique is hush. So that's where we're at now. But a trial is a test of the performance. And, and Chris, coaching this year, you're going to have a lot of trials uh, and a lot of tests. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. If we don't have tests and trials, these guys won't know whether or not these kids are ready for competition. They put, you know, uh, why does a runner run before the event? Now listen, I'm with you. The best thing about running is stopping. Possibly, I, by faith, I could even say the best thing about running is not even starting. But the Bible referred to this as a run, that we are in a race and we are running. But a test is, a, a, a trial is a test of the performance, the qualities or suitability of someone. A test is a tryout or an experiment. Trials and tribulations are a test of one's patience or endurance. That's what trials and tribulations are. Did you ever say to this, I've just about had more than I can stand. I'm just about ready to explode. I don't know how much more I can take. I hear that from Natalie. I don't know how long I can endure this. Uh, She has learned the next time to pray for cooler weather. And any of you that has been through this time of season and this time of year, this far into your pregnancy, hope that your children are born in May or or when it's had cooler months. But uh, a test or a patience, and, and before you start saying, I told Bobby or somebody, uh, that if, if, if I had, I guess Sharon and those that work with these kids have the patience of Job. School teachers have to have the patience of Job and the wisdom of Solomon and the love of Jesus to endure all of this. It's just like, I don't know how you do it. There has to be a calling in there. School teachers don't make enough money for it not to be a calling. 
but <laughs> I could get in trouble in a hurry. We can't pay them what they're worth. I'll guarantee you that. But before you start praying for patience, remember that tribulation, trials, test is what makes patience. So here's what I thought this morning. If, uh, if we are in that, uh, Hatley, 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, here's the thing that many people say to me. Why am I going through this? If I'm a Christian and I love Jesus and I'm living my life the way I'm supposed to, now, now there are fiery trials, Robert, that we put ourselves in. If you are in it because you sinned in it, and you're sinning and you're in trouble. Well, know this. The Bible said this too. It said, Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And you know what the wages of sin is? Here's the misconception of that. Well, I can go ahead and sin. I can ask God to forgive me, and it won't cause me any trouble. You're wrong. For one thing, sin always has a payment. I don't care if you've done it secretly. I don't care if you've done it ignorantly. I don't care if it was premeditated. The wages of sin is death because that we don't walk up and just shoot you because you are sinning or living in sin. And I know there's difference in sin. I I know that God looks at... We look at sin differently. I I know that we do. Everybody's got little sins and and we kind of say that's okay and I can drink a beer behind uh, the church's back or I can do this or I can say this and then there's those big sins to where well she's cheating on her husband or he's cheating on his wife or when she gets home he slaps her around and and, uh, he gambles and he lies and does all of that stuff you know we categorize sin and we say well they sin differently than we do the big sin now that we jump on as a religious people is homosexuality we jump on that sin just like it's the only one and, and you know how I stand. I, I don't think I have to say it over and over and over and over and over because, you know, I don't hate the sinner. And that, that's a mistaken thing when we stand and we say something against sin, Donnie. People think that we're against them automatically, but we're not against them. We're standing on what the Word of God said. But there, the, the sin of homosexuality, it turns our minds and it turns our stomach and, and, it, and the heart of God. But, Robert, I just see that any sin has to turn the heart of God that Jesus died for every single sin. And if people are living together and they're not married, they're living in sin. If you live ungodly and, and, and you you know, uh, if, if you... Boy, I could really get in trouble. The Bible said to lay aside every weight in the sin. The thing today is that nobody wants to call sin, sin. We want to just cover it up and say it's okay. We want to say, well... That boy and that girl, they're going together. Well, they're sleeping together, but it's okay because they're planning on getting married. Well, it's not okay because it's not okay in God's eyes. We may justify it and we may say, well, I'm in love, but you know what? The Word of God says that a man leaves his father and his mother, he cleaves unto his wife, and they become one flesh. Fornication is sin. It's a sin of the flesh, and it will cause a separation between you and God. You say, well, I don't feel as close to God today as what I used to feel. It could be because there's sin in your life. God hadn't moved. Do you understand that? God hadn't moved, but sin drives you from God. But but a trial, and now get back onto this, an unshakable faith, comes from having our faith shaken. Beloved, think it not strange. You might write that one down. Unshakable faith comes from having a faith that has been shaken. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Not every trial and not every test is sin activated or sin motivated. God puts us through trials and puts us through tests so that we might learn where we are in Him. How in the world would a teacher give a test after she has studied something and after the kids had, had prepared for it? How in the world is she doing that to just... I'll tell you why. It's to show her and you where you are in learning. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. 
if you be reproached for the name of Christ, here's what. People wear their feelings on their sleeve. They wear their feelings just waiting for somebody to knock them off. they just looking to get hurt. And if you're looking to get hurt, this is the best place for it to happen at. Y'all are just as quiet. You just hurt my feelings. You're saying, well, I'm not like, yes, you can. There's people you can't say nothing to without them taking it wrong. There's people that walk in looking for their feelings to get hurt. There's people that you've got to pet and you've got to pamper and you've got to pat around that are looking for their feelings to get hurt. If you're looking for that, it is going to happen. Somebody that loves you is going to say something. Somebody's going to say, well, he didn't even shake my hand. Somebody's going to say, well, they didn't even come by. They don't ever speak to me. And I know that we need to be a friendly people in a friendly church. And the Bible said a man got a friend. He's got to show himself friendly. I understand that. But you know what? We come in. We don't have time hardly to even visit. We don't have time. Sunday nights, we want to come and we want to fellowship. And I posted a question this week. Why do you not go to church on Sunday nights. I heard some very good, what I thought was reasonable explanations. They weren't sufficient, I don't think, that would answer to God, but they were sufficient for man. I heard people say, well, is it scripture or is it uh, biblical that we go to church on Sunday night? And then I turned and posted some scripture about the psalmist David, I said, which it said that by night they stand and they give praises in the house of the Lord. It is biblical. And the Bible in Hebrews, Jana posted or somebody on one of those sites, it said to forsake not the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and even much more as you see the day approaching. One lady came back. It was shared a bunch of times and I tried to follow every share because I'm really concerned and really wanted to know why people don't come to church. I've not been on your side of the pulpit for 35 years. I've been on this side. I've been wondering and I've been saying, well, it, it, I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand that we love the Lord on Sunday morning. We're ready to have church on Sunday morning. But you know what? Sometimes Sunday night, mostly nine out of ten times, Sunday night's the best service that we have all week. I don't understand that. Maybe it's because Sunday morning we're in a hurry. We're trying to get out. And I know that what the reason will be tonight, we got school tomorrow. But if your kid was in a softball tournament, we wouldn't go home early. We'd let them play that softball tournament. We'd throw water in their face in the morning, put an ice bag under their uh, back and we'd get them up and ready to go. But I don't, I, and that's the question. Why do we not go to church on Sunday night? And I was trying to figure out if it was my fault, if it's the church's fault, and people would pop up. And I wouldn't been looking to be judgmental. They want anybody judging anybody. I heard people say it was as much as this. Well, they don't love the Lord right. And I didn't say that. That was people commenting and putting their two cents worth in. There are people that have jobs. I understand that. I think God understands that. If that ox is in the ditch, you better work to get that sucker out or you're going to lose your ox. But if you pushed him in there just for the purpose of pulling him out to say I couldn't go, then shame on you. That ox is not only going to get in the ditch, but he's also probably going to die there. That's like that man one time that said when they made that great feast, and he said, well, and, and nobody showed up to the feast. Nobody came. And they said, well, why didn't they come? And this one man said, well, he said, I bought some land, and i got to go look at it. What lunatic in their right mind would buy land and all ought to know what you're getting and what you're buying? What man would say, well, I've married a wife and I can't come. Well, that's one downfall right there because a man that said, I've married a wife and I can't, that ain't no excuse. You might lose your wife. Don't stay home just because you might lose her. One said, I bought some oxen and I got to go prove them. Ron, would you give a big price for a horse without getting on that dude or trying him or watching him? That would be completely business insane. And you wouldn't come on a horse without knowing, or, or you wouldn't buy a, set, a pair of mules without knowing that G and Hall, they at least knew that. And y'all said, G and Hall, well, you don't know what that means. Well, the reason being, and, and that's what I wanted to know, why do you not come to church on Sunday night? I've got some pretty good reasons, got some pretty good excuses, I've got some, you know, just something. But I've not been on that side, Robert. I don't know what kind of church member I would be if I wasn't on this side of the pulpit. And I don't want to get aggravated or irritated or, or look down on you or, or let that even be a part of my preaching, why that I would bash you or destroy you or try to jump on you. But I will tell you it is biblical. And I will tell you, too, that one thing, it trials and 
test, if nothing else, I'm glad that I have a faithfulness that, and, and I'll tell you what a trial and a test might do. You may feel disconnected from your church. You may feel disconnected from your pastor. You may feel disconnected from your deacon board. You may feel disconnected from Sunday school. You may feel disconnected from the Lord. Why do you think that we have each other to lean on in the Bible? And that's one thing that trials and tests do. Trials and tests show us where we are with the Lord and show us where we are with our relationship. It reveals actually what's deep inside of us. It tells us who we are. Isn't it nice to look in the mirror and know that you came through that test or that trial and you learned something about where you are in your walk with faith and your walk with Christ? You're not the person that you were yesterday. Some of you, the trials and the obstacles become great. It knocks you to your knees and you get down and you get spiritually bruised. You get spiritually wounded and you wonder, will I get up? And if I do get up, am I going to be able to have joy again and, and full of glory? Am I ever going to be able to feel again? Listen, a trial or a test shows you right where you are in your walk. God uses all kinds of things to show us where we are. He'll use sickness. He'll use financial problems. He'll send storms in our life. Bobby, so that it will test us and it's not for God, but it's for us. It lets us know where we are. There are warning symptoms in our heart. There are warning symptoms in our soul. If there's something wrong with your marriage, there's warning symptoms. If you walk in and she don't speak to you, then there's problems. Or it may be a blessing. If you walk in and, and, and her bags are packed, it didn't happen overnight. If you walk in and he's gone and he'd rather fish or he'd rather hunt or he'd rather be with his friends or he'd rather be over to neighbors or he'd rather watch a ball game with somebody other than you, then there's problems. Do you understand that there are trials and tests? And no, it's not always easy, but it's necessary for God to wake us up, show us where we are, and test us so we might know if you're really serious about growing, then you must be really serious about the test and must realize where I am. The reason that I feel church is so important every time the doors are open is because that it is the opportunity for us to realize that we we need each other. Somebody said, I don't need nobody but the Lord. You have hit your head. We need, we need each other. The Bible said that where how many? You by yourself are not church. Now wait a minute. Why did you say that? Because the scriptures say where how many? Now I can have church, I can worship, I can get a blessing. I was riding in my crack rubber day, Robert, and number one song on that tape you gave me, I went after Jimmy and Ricky. I was driving, and I was cutting hay, and I was blue as you could get. I, I was being, I was discouraged. I guess I was being tested. I guess God was really seeing, was I really going to hang in there because everything that was done. And listen, I was broken hearted. I was broken spirit. My soul had been emptied, and I was discouraged, and I was down, and I heard that song and brother they went to singing and I looked up and tears listen tears started running down both sides of my cheek and I began to think oh my God you know things are bad but I've still got a hope beyond this grave I've still got a hope beyond this bell of tears I've never done it before in my life I just reared back and started shouting and they wasn't nobody there I kind of was like David I encouraged myself in the Lord and people probably thought I was a lunatic if they could have heard me but I was shouting that John Deere track I was shouting all in that cab until I done felt like that the Lord came down. I need somebody sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, it's good to have two or three because when we can agree together, the Bible said that where there are two or three gathered together, where? In His name. What did He say? I will be in the midst of them. We need each other. Trials and tests. We need each other. And each other, we need the Lord. And because we are brothers and sisters and fellow servants and fellow when the disciples, when the apostles were sent out, the 70 that time, Bobby, and they were going out to preach the gospel and to raise the dead and to heal the sick and to take up the serpent. And if they drank anything, the Bible said, it wouldn't hurt them. Jesus sent them out by twos. There were 70. I didn't think that you could have 35 and it'd be an even number later. But 35 times two is 70. And there they went out by twos and they came back. Why in the world do you think God gave us men to help me because he knew we couldn't make it by ourselves 
because he knew we was going to burn the gravy, because he knew we couldn't fix biscuits, because we knew that we couldn't clean the house and sweep the floor and, 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 and we couldn't have babies by ourselves. He made our women unique. You married to a woman that can hunt it, kill it, clean it, cook it, eat it, and then clean up after you, you got a woman. Come on. Why do you think God gave us a helpmate? So that we would not be alone. A man leaves his mother and his father, he cleaves to his wife, they become one, a helpmate. Why do you think that we have each other? Brothers and sisters in Christ, why do we have each other? Because we need each other. Is there another one? I, that's not all that one. How I got a bunch to read and I got to go with. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it first begin at us. What shall the end of them be? The end be of them that obey not the gospel of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, there we go, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? What's the difference between the ungodly person and the sinner? Is there a difference? What's the difference between an ungodly and a sinner? Would you say somebody that's ungodly had once been godly? I'm just asking a question. That way I can't get any trouble and I want your mind to go see smoke coming out of some of the wheels. But if someone is ungodly, were they at one time godly? Because the two distinctions are one's ungodly and one is a sinner. And so if the ungodly were the sinner and the ungodly shall appear, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing and so unto a faithful creator. Is that all that one hat? All right, what's the next one I put down there? <coughs> She'll. <coughs> okay, let me go ahead. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight uh, and the uh, and which do, uh, which does so easy. Yeah, let us lay aside the weight. Do we need to get in? No, lay aside the weight and the sin. Looking unto Jesus, who the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where is he at? I heard some of the most ridiculous stuff come from Joyce Myers this week. One of my friends uh, posted it on Facebook, said Jesus died on the cross. He went into hell. He was the first one to be born again. The devil jumped on him, and, the, and all hell stomped on him, and all hell leaped on him, and all hell had him down there in the pits of hell, and they were just beating Jesus up. And then he finally got up and came on out of there, and he got born again. Honey, you need to burn her material, throw her junk in the trash, and you need to turn her television program on. Jesus did not go into hell. Satan did not jump on him and kill him when he died on the cross where did he say you may say well he took the keys of death hell in the grave that's a different story we're talking about Hades we're talking I, I'd love to teach on this sometime we're talking about that gulf that was fixed we're not talking about the eternal lake of fire where death and hell is going to be cast into someday the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes yes that was hell but it was he's also one day going to be resurrected again in a body that will burn eternally and, and I don't want to get into all that because well, you say boy you got the wheels turning and I don't want to get that deep and I'm not deeper than a mud puddle and we don't need to go there because now I'll be all confused. I'm just telling you where Abraham, Isaac, and all of those men that had died in faith, Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Jacob, all that went on through the eons of time when Jesus died on the cross, he showed the thief brother, he said, I'm going to paradise, you're going with me. Where was paradise? That was the place. Listen, I, 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 oh, I, I just, I'd love to spend an hour on this and, and help you because when Jesus died on the cross and he went into paradise, he told the thief to Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And when it said Abraham rejoiced to see my day, he saw it and was glad. I believe that he went and he led the captive. He preached peace. He preached uh, to the captives. He led them out. He ascended into heaven. That while Jesus was there on the cross, that after that he had died, or while he was dying, Bobby, the Bible said those that slept, many of the saints stood up in their graves. I didn't know that people didn't know that. There are many of the people. That 
Bible's a resurrection. You can say about 47 things you want to about resurrection. There was a resurrection took place the day that Jesus died. They set up in their graves, and the Bible said after Jesus had risen, they came out of their graves, and they went into the holy city, and people saw those that had been dead and had been resurrected, and they say, how in the world will I know who they are? There on the Mount of Transfiguration, people say, I can't figure out what people will know me in heaven. Oh, yeah, they'll know you because I guarantee you Peter, James, and John had never seen Moses and Elijah. But the moment that they showed up on the Mount Mount of Transfiguration, they knew exactly who those two old prophets were. They didn't have carousels to put people's photos on. They didn't have marquees to hang their pictures on. I'll tell you what, they knew who it was because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. And the Bible said that we will be known as we are known. Honey, I'm telling you that they knew who Moses and Elijah was and they never ever met them. I know who Jesus is. I may not never meet him but I'll promise you that I'll follow him when he comes because he is a shepherd and the shepherd, how do you know? Is it important to hear from God? You can't just go by sight. We can't just walk by sight. What the Bible say? How will I know who he is? He said the sheep, the sheep they hear my voice and they know my voice. There's another one they would not follow. You have to know the voice of God. How can I know the voice of God? You'll know the voice of, I'm about to preach now. You'll know the voice of God by knowing the word of God. And you'll know the word of God by the will of God. It is not of flesh. It is not of blood. But it's not of works. By any man should boast. It is the Bible said that the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us. And we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father. You will know his voice because you know his word. And it said that we will not follow a stranger. We will follow follow the good shepherd. I said, my sheep know my voice. Looking unto Jesus. Ooh, that name. It, that don't excite us anymore. Thomas told me the other day, I'm throwing my glasses. Thomas told me the other day, what's that cat that came and spoke at the marina, one of them presidential guys? Who was he? Who? Ted Cruz? Right down from Thomas's house, Thomas said, you thought an exodus was taking place. So there was people passed by his house by the hunters, just zoom, 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 zoom. Go to see Ted Cruz. Well, whoopity, doopity, do. I'm sick of these politicians just telling us things. I'm tired of them telling us what they're going to do. Give me somebody that's got some brass about themselves. I just almost messed up. Give me somebody that's got some brass about themselves that will do it and not just say it. But they drive and line up. How many of you ever been to that when one of those big uh, fishing tournaments come? I was watching Kevin Van Dam and I was watching the Bassmaster Classic on television one day. And you know there are people that go out there just to watch them fish? No. Do you know how ignorant that is? To go watch somebody fish? I don't give a real how they're doing it. Fishing ain't no fun unless you're fishing. And I ain't going to watch. I'm not going to sit out there when Icky Icky Bob or whatever his name. What's that, what's that crazy one's name that we don't like, Chuck? Echinelli. Uka, him. I'd want to sink his boat. And how many times have we heard, you got to be quiet to fish. And they'd be catching a fish and scream like they've lost their mind. That's the whole thing about that. Ain't nothing about fishing. And there ain't no way I'm going to drive and stand in line just to see that name. When I can show up here this morning and say that name, and that name right there, the Bible said, is a name above every name mentioned in heaven and earth. That name is so marvelous that if you mention it in the very presence of the storm, it calms and brings peace. That name, when you're sick, you don't want to call Cruz. You don't want to call Akinelli. You don't want to call Van Dam. You don't want to call John Daly. You don't want to call... My Michael Jordan, 
You don't want to call Johnny McCoy. You don't want to call J.D.'s Mercantile. When you're sick and you're down, you definitely don't want to call St. Mary's. Oh, did I go there? You want to call on the name of Jesus. And the reason that he is so close to us is because that his trial or his test that he has put on our life has brought us closer. God did not send that test and God did not send that trial to send you away. He said he would not. You say, well, I'm about to break. I've got more on me than I can bear. Know the word of God. Know what the Bible says. That the trial of our faith, which is being more precious than gold, the reason that we are tested, he promised us, Donnie, we will not have more on us than what we could bear. It didn't say the load wouldn't get heavy. He didn't say the cross wouldn't get heavy. He didn't say the sickness wasn't real. He didn't say the finances wasn't a problem. He didn't say my feelings wasn't hurt. He didn't say that my body is in pain. He didn't say that my addictions are real. But he said, I will not put more on you than you can bear. And you say, well, that's the end of it. No. It may seem like there's more than you can bear and you're at the breaking point. But remember, he said that when with that temptation, with that trial, with that sickness, with that test, he would make a way of escape. The way of escape when there's more, when there's more than you can handle, and there's more than you can carry, and there's more than you can bear. Listen, that's why, Robert, that we need somebody to lean on, because when we can't carry our, do you know of that Jesus couldn't even carry the cross himself, and they picked out a boy in the crowd named Simon of Serene to help him bear the cross. What if he had not been there? He would have had to carry that cross himself or pick someone else. I'm telling you that sometimes we get knocked down. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we're blue. Sometimes we're lonely. Sometimes we're broke. Sometimes we're weary. Sometimes we're confused. Sometimes we're depressed, discouraged, distracted, and defeated. But I'm telling you, he has promised us that he will never leave me. He will not forsake me. Know the word of God. Know that he is always there and you know the name of that will get you to help carry that load. We need each other. I can lean on Bobby. I can lean on Robert. I can lean on Frank. I can lean on Bro. Well sometimes I can lean I can lean on Grady. I can lean on my wife. I can lean on my kids. I can lean on my son-in-law. I can lean on Brad. I can lean on any. You know I've got friends I can lean. Lean on me. When you're not strong. We've got people we can lean on. That's why we need the church. That's why we need each other. But there's times, Bobby, that you're not there. There's times that you're dragging and I'm dragging. Aren't you glad that there's a name above every name? That when you call on that name, even the devil shakes in his shoes. He trembles at the name of Jesus because that name is wonderful, mighty. He is counselor. He is prince of peace. At that name... And we use that name just like it's nothing more than the name of a presidential candidate. The Bible said every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. But Jesus was the author, finisher of our faith. Nobody else but Jesus, who for the joy, I'm not going to get done with this one tonight. I'll finish it. This morning I'll finish tonight because I want to get on temptation tonight. Right now I'm getting on the test, and, and I wrote down all kinds of things. I wrote this down. A trial, uh, I can't read my writing, will reveal what's already in you, and it will reveal what you are made of. A trial will reveal your weaknesses and show you just where you're at and what you need. A trial will show you we need each other. Then I said why well, he sent them out in twos. A trial will, will draw you closer to God. You have to learn to depend on Him because you cannot do it by yourself. I wrote all these things down about 4 o'clock this morning. The Lord woke me up. And I said, well, I'll change my message for somebody. When you study all week for something, you get something else, you know somebody needs to hear something. And uh, so here, uh, I won't even go into those other ones till tonight, Hatley says, uh, what's, is there another one after that or is that it? Mary, come. Are you okay? Mary's been down all week. 
what day did you go down? Wednesday? Thursday? I had her up cleaning and she pulled the muscle. I could just about say you your own shoes today. It's just whatever you want to do, just fine, preacher. But you're tested and you have trials. So what do I do? If you've sinned and you're having problems, I'll deal with that tonight. Because you're you're reaping what you sowed. God may forgive, but people don't forget. But if you have peace with God about your situation or about what you've done, if you have peace with God, it ain't nobody's business from there on. People will hold that over your head the rest of your life. But if God has forgiven you and it is under the blood, don't fret what people think no more. If you're sinning today, and your life is falling apart today, stop your sinning, get right with God, get a hold of the cross, apologize to the person that you've been the devil to, apologize to the person that has mistreated you, apologize to the person that you've mistreated, Apologize for God because you mistreated Him. He's not like people that hold grudges. God doesn't hold grudges. Some of you beat yourself up because your marriage failed. Well, look what I've done. Not a thing in the world we can do about that now. Is there? Not a thing in the world. You may have learned something. If if you came in and just learn from our mistakes, I'm saying. But if sin has put you in trouble, God didn't do that to you. But if you're living the very best that you can for the Lord, are you? I'm not going to ask you that, but it just give you a chance to think about that. If you're doing your best for the Lord, are you as close to the Lord now as you used to be? Who moved? Oh, well, the preacher, that's his fault. The preacher's got to feed me and the preacher's got to... No, I don't. That ain't my job. If the only time you ever get any service or the only time you ever get any teaching, the only time you ever read your Bible is when Hadley puts it up on the board, it's no wonder. It's no wonder you're sick. It's no wonder that you're not encouraged. It's no wonder. Tracy back there teaches. Do they have text? Do they have books now or just computers? When we was kids... We had a little book that said, See, Spot, Bark, or who was it? Did Spot run? What was the Tom, Jane, one of them was Jane. Who? I can't, do or you just, Dick and Jane. See, Jane, run. You know, I didn't care nothing about Dick. I always liked Jane. And I learned right quick that Dick don't go with Jane Tarzan does. And I can remember, Tracy, when we was kids, in the first grade, we had pencils. The the time that my hand was the smallest that it's ever been, they gave me a pencil the size of a breadstick from Pizza Hut. Y'all remember that? And then I remember that they taught us cursive writing. I've been able to write Chinese all my life because can't understand nothing I write. 
and I'm not slamming Chinese people, but you try to read, I can't read it, I can't read them. That's like a doctor. They give a doctor all the information. They spend a million dollars on their education, and then they write something that you've got to be, you got to spend a million dollars just to read what they wrote. Pick up that doctor and see what he writes. It looks like somebody's chicken scratching on there. But Robert, I remember, like in third grade, when we learned, learned cursive writing, we had that paper had the little lines on it. Y'all remember that? And you had to stay inside the lines and do all that. She teaches out textbooks, I'm sure, and now the computers. That book right there, if you really want to learn how to get close to God, and you really want to learn about overcoming marital problems, sin problems, death problems, financial problems, every problem, every trial, everything, the answer is in that book right there. I'm not going to be able... Well, I go over every Sunday because I, I'm under the impression if I were to gamble and I were to bet today... I would say that the most of you, and, 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 and I don't know this, if it makes you mad, then it's you that I'm talking about probably. The most of you that's got the most problems are the same ones that has not read the book and can't take the test. When you know the book and you read the book and it lives in you, I read it when I was a kid. I brought up in Sunday school, got all my pens. Yes, but the older you get, the test gets greater. The older you get, the test is harder. The older that you get, once you get a wife and a kid and a job and a dog and a car and a mortgage, and all, things get harder. Once you love people and you have your heart broken, things get harder. When you're a kid, you can get by with Jesus' wealth. You can get by with Jesus loves me, this I know. You can get by with the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. You can get by with that when you're little. But you need something now that will hold you when all hell starts breaking loose in your life. When you walk home and your husband's packed his bags and he's gone, you walk home and the wife has packed her bags and she's gone. You come home and the person that you love the most is dying with cancer in the hospital. You come home and you get a call that your daughter has been in an accident or your son has been in an accident. Your grandkid is in the emergency room. I'm telling you, things get tougher as you get older and we've got to have a closer walk with thee. Why do you think they sung the song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee? Granted, Jesus is my plea. Yesterday's blessing is gone. Yesterday's feeling is gone. Yesterday is gone. We need a new fresh anointing. We need a new fresh relationship with God. We need to open that book again and read that thing like we did in Sunday school. Years ago, Sunday school is gone. It's out the window. We don't have Sunday school much anymore. People come at 11 if they come at all. And the reason that we are so spiritually illiterate is because we've taken the Word of God from off the shelf and we've replaced it with our habits and our hobbies. We are hanging on to it. And you know, we need more of the Word of God inside us. We don't need it just there. I can close this book and it won't do me no good. Uh, but if I'm lonely and I'm having trouble and I'm sick, Dominic, when I'm in the emergency room and it don't look like I'm going to live, I can open up the Word of God and say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered from them all. I can open up the Word and I can know that He said I'll not leave you. I can open up the Word and know that when I feel alone. Listen, when I feel alone and nobody understands me and nobody gets me, I can open up the Bible and say it. And there's one that says that there's a friend that sticks closer than the brother. I can open up the Bible and I can know that my enemies are all around me, Wendell, and everything is falling apart. And here's what he told me. You know, when we're busy and we're in storms and we got trouble and we get hungry physically or spiritually, you know what the Bible said? He said, I'll even prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. He said, your cup's going to run over and when I feel like nothing's going right and everything's going wrong I can look behind me and the word of God said that goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life and what did he say after that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever he never leaves me his shield his rod, his rod and his shield they comfort me he anoints my head in the front and my help 
Oh, what did he do, Bobby? He anoints my head, and the Bible said my cup runs over. We need our cup running over again. But you got to open that book because inside, uh, closing it, uh, uh, it's the most empty book looking at it like that. But when you open it, you'll find there's life, there's hope, there's hell, there's Jesus. It reveals to us who he is. It reveals us who we are. And it also reveals uh, that I have somebody that can help me. What's wrong in your life today? You need the word of God to come alive in you again. It needs to jump off these pages. Oh, why do you think? Woo, I know you want to go home. I ain't going to let you go just yet. Smile at me. I know what you need today is the red letter right off the press from glory to be opened up and let the love of God flood your soul. You need some hope. You need some help. You need some peace. Thy word is true. Jimmy Deal, it's a game changer. Let me go a little bit farther and say it's a life changer. It is rest to the weary. <laughs> it is rest for the weary. It is help for the helpless. It is hope for the hopeless. It's a friend to the friendless. It's a comfort to the sick. It is an ever-present help in the time of need. And at that name, you hear me? At that name, oh God, we want to bring up what's been done to us. And we want to bring up what we've done to others. I'm so ashamed of my past. I'm glad Mary's never asked me everything that I've ever done on my deathbed. I hope she don't ask me then. For years and years and years, I run myself down thinking I'd been so bad to find the thunder would God even offer to give me three healthy children. One's a nut, but that's okay. He's all right. Why, if we got spiritual fruits, why do I got nuts hanging out in my yard? <laughs> why in the thunder did I, I... What did I deserve do to deserve God's goodness and His mercy? If I'd have got what I deserved, I'd got death. If I'd have got what was I do me, it would have been nothing good. But here I stand before you today, imperfect as you are, but very blessed and very thankful and highly favored. I know what God's plans are for me to prosper me and to do good and for me to walk and to dwell in His fellowship and in His presence. Yet, death is coming. Death is coming to every single one of us. But you know what? The devil uses death to discourage us. He uses death to bring us down. He uses death to get to us. I'll be honest with you. I had to take that test. I believe God tested me through Jimmy and through Sister Betty and through uh, Ricky and through others that I've loved. I believe God tested me. I believe He was just seeing. You know what? I, didn't, I know they didn't die for me to benefit. Those that die in Christ uh, have gone home to live with Christ forever. Death to us ain't no big deal if you know Jesus, but it hurts. Uh, this today was my grandfather's birthday, and I hurt all day, Bobby, about my grandpa being gone. Wouldn't I love to see my best friend that God ever gave me, my fishing buddy, the one that I could go to if I needed money. He always bailed me out. Whatever I needed, I had grandpa. Some of y'all had mom and some you had daddy and probably we all uh, just kind of didn't really appreciate it growing up and maybe I didn't uh, but I remember when I owed my grandpa money one time Donnie after he got older in years I bought a truck uh, I'd go mow his yard uh, for him for nothing and he'd ride off the list uh, every time that I'd mow he'd take a little bit off and when he died I went to granny and I said granny what do I owe you she told me the, granny I bought a 77 Ford pickup long wheelbase traded my 65 Mustang only had one seat to impress some girl in high school and I went and found that note uh, that my dad had made uh, and I'd mowed his yard all those times and I took care of painting his house and doing little things. He said paid in full uh, and I know that I hadn't paid that pay. Uh, brother I'm glad uh, that when I stand before God someday <laughs> and that devil tries to bring up the sins of my past uh, and the sins of my youth uh, and he tries to tell me you're not worthy. Oh Mark uh, I'm glad that when I stand uh, in the very presence 
sons of God uh, there on the page uh, of the book of life. Uh, it said paid in full. Uh, I know that Kathy's got one of them stamps uh, that says no to Republic. Uh, and I've been for places uh, and they stamped their seal on there. Well, honey, uh, uh, in the book, uh, uh, there's a seal that's been stamped. Uh, it's been crooked in the blood of Jesus uh, and it's put over my name uh, and it's applied to my life uh, and my sin debt is paid in full. Uh, I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he did not owe, but he paid that debt. And today I am free, I am washed, I am clean by the blood of Jesus. Yesterday God is gone. And we can either quit worrying about spilt milk and get up and go on and live for God. We cannot let yesterday defeat our day and our purpose. If yesterday is still hanging over us, Thank you, Heavenly Father. If yesterday is still closing in on us and holding over our head, we need to get it under the blood. Yesterday's gone, and the devil will use yesterday as long as he can. But today is the day. Woo! The day is the day. Can I just one moment? The day is the day the Lord hath made. Today is the day. I will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> you got to get over yesterday to have any kind of hope for tomorrow what is your life it's a vapor for a long time I couldn't forgive myself for a long time and if I told you it still, it didn't bother me still, I'd be lying to you. But it doesn't bother me to the point that I let it discourage me no more. Because I know that book. That book told me when I confessed it to him, he don't even remember it no more. The things that I remember and bring up, he don't even remember it. People do. These people still can't believe I'm a preacher. And then these people that's heard me still can't believe I am. How did you get to where you are now? By not giving up. By not giving up. I drank as much whiskey as anybody in this room. And I smoked as much pot as you could carry in that truck. The reason I don't do it no more is because I did not give up. God had a plan for my life. Why do you think you didn't give up when you grew up and was molested and you're still struggling through the struggle? Because you didn't quit. And the devil has said quit a hundred times. One lady has come to me one time and she said, I was molested by a family member. He's died. What do I do? I said, do you really want peace? And she I want peace. I said, you go to his grave and you tell that headstone that you forgive him. It won't change the circumstance. It won't change the situation. But until you forgive them the rest of your life, the rest of your life, Satan will needle that at you. The rest of your life, it will haunt you to your grave. I deserve more than that. I deserve more than my past always showing up in my present and in my future. I deserve more, Don, than the alcohol and the drug. I deserve more than that because I am a son of the most... Come on, Travis Plumley. I am a son of the Most High God. His royal blood flows through my veins. The blood of Jesus has covered my sin. I am no longer that person. He lives in me and I live in Him. His Spirit dwells in me. I will no longer... I will no longer... I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired I said no more devil no more maybe it's time you just put your foot down and say devil no more I'm not going to walk in the house and be an abusive husband no more I'm not going to be a slothful wife anymore I'm not going to have this anymore I am tired I'm not going to be a disrespectful teenager anymore come on say amen somebody I'm not going to be a disrespectful student in my class I'm going to school to learn I'm going to learn the three R's writing reading Arithmetic, four hours, respect, and we're going to be men and women of faith in God. Today is the day that we.
we get free from yesterday? That one name. See that name right there? That one name. Father, as I close, let the power and the glory and the authority and the deity of that name come into this room now and break every bondage in our lives today in Jesus' name. If you'd stand just a moment as they sing. Every Sunday I feel going over destructive to my ministry and I can't help it. I know what works. The old weapons still work. The cross really did say it all. The storms really do pass when you bring the master into the ship or in the situation. You can't do this by yourself. A house divided against itself won't stand. This house, your house, any house won't stand. Bring God on board. Or wake up the relationship that you have with Him Wake him up and let the master do the driving. You've been driving long enough, and how's that working out for you? A head-on collision about to destroy you. As they sing, I want you to come today and kneel at the cross. Come on. Anybody today, I have preached my heart out to you. And you can either leave with victory or defeat. I'll tell you what's going to happen if you don't obey God. It's going to be worse. How can it get any worse? Because you missed the opportunity for your help today. Come on. entire family come on life changing decisions made today come on guys he's standing in the gap he's standing in the gap this couple here Sails are torn. I have fallen. Come on. You got just a few minutes. The most important moments you'll spend today. The raging seas, the anchor hold. In spite. Let's wake up the master. You need encourage. You need strength. Come on, and let's pray. 
You don't know how you're going to make another day. But I never so knew. You're so tired. How am I going to go? Because the joy of the Lord will be your strength today. Like they were only grains of sand. And the the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas, the anchor got more than more on your plate than you can handle you need each other today to pray for you as I face there is power in prayer the raging come on the anchor how am I gonna make it by prayer in spite come on of the storm felt impressed to have Mary just leave the piano and come pray with Christy. Some of you ladies in this room would like to come. I know it's late and you must go. I'll see you tonight. But she, let me tell you something. This kid right here has been under the gun. Just attacked and death and, and loss. If, if you're a praying lady, come pray. Or you want a praying guy, come pray with Christy. We, we want her to touch the master this morning. Come on. If you need to go, I'll see you. May the Lord bless you tonight. Today, and I'll see you tonight.